we put all of our faith in AI, right? We we almost feel inferior. You know, AI doesn't need to eat, doesn't need to sleep. It's it's got you know, it's it, all of our worldly impediments have been. It's not affected by it. So, in that regard, as a humanist, I believe that the value and input of a human being is still ex- going to exceed what artificial intelligence can do. Santiago, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me, Benoit. I'm I'm very excited to to yap and talk. <laughs> very excited. So I want to get straight into the bread and butter of your expertise. So what is a reality behind filmmaking and Sundance Film Festival that a lot of people just don't really know about? Well, okay. So I think in general, filmmaking is such a nebulous kind of craft. I, I think.、Um, To put it, you know, simply, I think if you ask the average person, how do you make money with films, you know, making films, it's really confusing.、Uh, you know, there's there's so many different ways. There's streaming. There's direct distribution. There's, you know, doing commercials, right? But that doesn't always come off very obviously. It's a very difficult field to get into. But if you have the tenacity and the ability to stick around through tough times. Um, those are the people that end up lasting, and you know, obviously, you can have a lot of displacements in terms of trajectory. It's never the career is never a straight line.、Um, you hear this from all the greats, and、um, to get a film actually made, like a true, like a like a narrative film, it is probably one of the hardest things to do.、Um, in terms of you know, most most people try to do it. There's probably hundreds of thousands of people that try to do it. And they can't because it's just really, really difficult to get the money going, or to get the projects, or to get the actor. You know, there are so many variables. And just to wrap this up, because I know I'm rambling a little bit, the you know, a film requires, and I'm talking about narrative film, but also commercial. It requires an expertise of almost every discipline, right? You're dealing with wardrobe, you're dealing with、uh, direction, you're dealing with、um, you know lighting, you're dealing with architecture, you're dealing with story, you know, just poetry, l- l- lyricism, you're dealing with writing. I mean, it's just it's like everything. So I think for people that crave a lot and they and they like the challenge, it can be very rewarding. But you have to go into it willing to tackle all of those things. In my opinion, some people would disagree with me, but I think. You always need to have a team supporting you,、uh, of course. But the best directors, the best filmmakers, they they they're ready to dive in to learn everything and get their hands dirty. So, so I want to zoom out to the macro really quickly. Sure. So, from your experiences over a decade, right? How do you feel like the landscape of filmmaking has shifted in the current twenty first centuries in the twenty twenty three? Versus maybe from the '90s to early '20s, or even before. Like, how has the landscape shifting? Right,、constantly? right. I think、um, you know this goes for everything. It's and it's not unique to film, obviously, right? Like,、um, you know, this sort of rapid expansion of technology、um, in the last 20 years, right? The, the the interval of the last 20 years versus the last 50 years, these intervals of technological advancement are getting even shorter and shorter, right? And so I think everyone can relate to that, especially with ChatGPT and AI, right? The last Twenty years with the internet, social media. I mean, everything has completely changed.、Um, so, everyone feels very familiar with that theme. And so, I think when it comes to filmmaking, you know, it's very difficult to、um, generate revenue in this new landscape because nobody knows. Like investors, right? Like if you invest in a house or if you buy property, it's a very tried and true method of of generating income. But with filmmaking, the whole landscape completely changed. So now it's like. You know, large, really large corporations. There's really two kinds of films, right? There's really large corporate films that are backed by like huge studios、um, because they have the money, like Marvel, like Marvel, or yeah, you know, whatever. The, this the big, the big studios, Disney, right? Which are very institutional. They've got lots of executives, lots of managers, lots of. Eight, I mean, it's a, it's a machine. That's that's amazing. It's a, it's an amazing machine, and it produces a lot of amazing things. But then there's a gap. Right then, it's like you know you have the multi-million-dollar projects, and then now you have most of it being in this indie realm, which is almost like people scrapping money together, you know, from investors. And those budgets can range from you know a couple hundred thousand dollars to a couple million dollars. But there, there's this this middle range which used to exist in the '90s and the '80s and the '70s has started to go away a little bit because of the change in distribution. 
because it all comes down to distribution. They had DVDs, right? You had um, theatrical releases, which were a huge revenue generator. So now that those themes have changed because of VR and because of the pandemic and just because of streaming, right? Like if you were doing it in the 90s, you know, you say, hey, I have this large celebrity. We'll We'll do direct to DVD. We can project the revenue in a much more concrete way. It's never guaranteed, but, you know, it's a lot more repeatable. And, you know, hey, we can do straight to DVD or straight to video. And those movies would make a lot of money. Now, it's like you could, and and some of those just made no money. Like, obviously, sometimes it's just a complete flop. But it was a little more forgiving. And now it's, it's very much like, this is why streaming is so popular. Because streaming, it's like the company, you know, pulls all of its resources together. It's a massive company. They can afford to spend, you know, 20 projects. 19 of them fail, right? And one of them is Stranger Things right? But, you know, and that goes for any business, right? Like even during the pandemic, um, large, mega large corporations, they were able to survive because they had capital accumulated, you know, whereas small creators or small business owners, they couldn't really survive because maybe they had two shops and if one goes under, they're out, you know, whereas, you know, McDonald's, you know, they can have a thousand chains go out and the revenue from their real estate and their other branches is going to cover it. There is a lot there. So my brain's going towards Steve Jobs, where sure. I read his biography. Of course, he is one of the greatest innovators ever. Yeah. Now, one thing he has known is the disruptor of film industry, right? Like Pixel. And you're alluding to a lot of the gatekeepers as the underlying theme in the film industry. And of course, music industries where gatekeepers are less and less prevalent right. because of the increased individual autonomy of the creators. So... A, how is the gatekeepers going with the film industry, with the executives you alluded to? And also, how does film industry perceive innovation like a major disruptor like Steve Jobs and other people like? Ooh, that's a really interesting connection you made with the music industry. And and I'll just start off, too. I don't want to villainize executives, right? Not saying you were, not saying I was, right? But, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, the executives. But but (laughs) at the end of the day, too, they're, they're doing a lot of quality control. And we take for granted that they are doing a, a good job in some senses. And obviously, everyone's going to not do a perfect job. But, you know, quality control. There's a lot of films that are really bad <laughs> that they say, hey, no, you know. So so we don't see the really bad stuff. And then we just take for granted the stuff that's been done well. The point you made about the music industry, I think when you really break down filmmaking and what the sort of fundamental limiters are, it's capital. And I think that is with the music industry, right? Like, you know, you could produce an entire album from your garage with a couple micro, you know, you maybe need, I'm being generous, let's just say ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of um, recording equipment and a nice facility. You know, that, the overhead there is, a, it, it came down considerably. Back in the day, right, if you were Frank Sinatra or somebody big or the Rolling Stones or whatever, you know, you had, you had multi-million dollar recording studios. And now you can do that in your garage with $30,000. That didn't change as much for filmmaking. Intuitively, you would think, oh, well, you know, cameras are easy, you know, more um, accessible and they've gotten better. Everyone has a camera on their phone. Why isn't filmmaking cheaper? Well, because at the end of the day, filmmaking is like building a house or, or it's like construction. I mean, it's like, you know, you need so many things. It's, it's so physical, Music is so in your head, right? It's physical, obviously. You got to play the instruments, but filmmaking, it's like you got to get the location, you got to get the people there. Like it's just a lot of physical stuff. So um, that's kind of what prevents it from having that breakthrough, like the music industry did, and that's what's preventing it from being truly democratic. If I was able to go make a film that right now would cost five million dollars, and I could go make that for fifty thousand dollars. All of a sudden, now you're going you're gonna to see a marketplace emerge, and you're going to see the the next genesis of what it can be emerge. So that's the that's the limiting factor right now. And I think I answered most of the question, but right. So I want to segue into another question, which is related. Where I'd love for you to fact check this. Sure. There's a lot of stereotypes yeah. and potentially misconceptions and fallacies around what filmmaking industry is. But one of the most common one is along with music industry and fashion, right. filmmaking industry is known as the greediest and one of the most difficult fields to survive and sustain. Sure. You alluded to it in the beginning of the conversations. So A, can you fact check that? And B, what are some of the reasons or attributable like contributing factors to make this such a greedy industry outside of the high entry points with the capitals? The greediness part is definitely true 
in a lot of ways. I think when you look at really big actors, when you look at the, it's always, it's always management, right? It's like management and actors and, you know, they're, they're going to be taking a lot of the revenue, you know, and, and a lot of people do get into it because the pay can be really crazy for actors, you know, and at the, at the end of the day, the, the audience isn't really connecting with the director as much. They are, they are in some senses, you know, James Cameron, you know, these names, you know, Stanley Kubrick, right? You connect with the director, but at the end of the day, it's Tom Cruise's face right. that you're seeing, you know, that power, because you have to build a movie around a celebrity. You can get away with not doing that, but let's be real. You know, if you get Tom Cruise in your movie, people are going to pay attention and they're going to go buy it. So they know they have the power and it's not even necessarily wrong that they have the power. I mean, they are acting. It's the idea of, you know, this is where we can maybe weave geometry into this and, and some <laughs> philosophy, right? Let's do it. It's, it's, you know, the pyramid, you know, if, you, if a current runs through a pyramid, at the tip of the pyramid is going to have the highest concentration per square meter. And as the, as the current runs through the pyramid, right, it gets distributed exponentially more across the surface area. It's like that for any industry, right? There's, maybe there's a law firm that's raking in 90% of the business. The next biggest law firm is raking in 8%. And then all 1,000 other law firms are raking in the next two, uh, 2%, right? So I think it's the same thing with filmmaking. And I think the fact that can be very misleading because people forget, you know, that there's that 98% of other people that are not making that kind of money. Um, and that's where things get real nasty. You know, this entire city, Los Angeles, is full of actors, directors, producers. I mean, everybody wants to be in the film industry. The entire city, like almost the entire city. Um, I'm overstating a tiny bit, but you know what I mean. Right. You can, I mean, you can go to a bar and you talk to 10 people, guaranteed five are going to be in the film industry, maybe more. So that's the thing. It, it's, it's, it's a dream-crushing city, and that is not... A negative thing, though, because that actually um, it keeps it real, and that's what makes it good. In the sense, yeah, it's ugly. A lot of people fail. A lot of people never even get off the ground. But it's like the art. Like that's why the art is good. That's why you know cinema has moved forward. Just like to be a, a astrologist or be an astronaut or be a quantum physicist, the weed out rate is fairly high. But that's what makes it an art form, right? And I'm thinking about this quote from La La Land. I think Ryan Gosling said this, paraphrasing it. He said, Los Angeles is a city where people pay more attention to the pictures of the city than the city itself. Right. As in, it's all about the glamorized post-production versus the actual enjoyment of that moment. And I want to tie this into mental health because that's what I do. I'm an abstract thinker. And a lot of psychologists talk about acquired narcissism. What that means is certain people have genetic markers, predispose them to become narcissists, personality disorder. A lot of folks in the actors and filmmaking industry, through nurturing, through environmental feedback, they become acquired right. narcissists. Right. Because you see these stereotypes, you see these movies. Sure. Everyone's yes men. Right. Right. Yes. You want water? Yes. You either the best, especially in K-drama. They worship them like gods. So what is your experience in terms of what I just shared and anything you want to share in terms of the slippery slope in terms of mental health, because I think humans need speed bumps, people who slow you down, people to check you. And through this checking and this interplay of confrontations, people grow. And I think at large filmmaking, a lot of major actors lack that, not to their fault, but just the environment they're in. Whew, that's, yeah, I mean, okay, so I'll start with narcissism in terms of the actors and how it, how it balloons in the film industry. Obviously, when you're an actor, it's your face, you know, so it's, <laughs> right. it's, you know, how can you not be obsessed with yourself a little bit if you're making money and you're, you know, so, and also in the sense that it's, it's a lot less of a traditional industry, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the film industry that would not necessarily happen at a hospital or like a law firm, uh, you know, maybe that's an overstatement, maybe I'm generalizing a little too much, but my point is, is that because the format is so open and it's so all over the it's art, right? It's, it's so random. Like, for example, mo a movie can be made like a thousand different ways. You know, people think the, the title of director, cinematographer, or editor, is, it's, it's like very clear cut. It's not clear cut at all. You know, an actor might be also kind of directing a little bit or he also might be producing. So, so when you don't have these very defined like categories, right? And, and, and when it actually benefits the art to not have defined categories, it starts to get really nebulous and 
you can get these runaway train situations where like an actor becomes super powerful and they end up directing the movie. For example, if you, if you saw the last, uh, I keep talking about Tom Cruise. He's a great actor. I love him. One of my <laughs> favorite is. actors in, in Eyes Wide Shut, one of my favorite um, films. You know, in Mission Impossible, there's this, there's this featurette and it's hilarious because I don't know if, if you've seen it, but um, he does a, he, he rides a motorcycle off of a ramp in parachutes. I remember that scene. Right. So it, it's it's just really over the top Hollywood. I love it. It's it's amazing. Right. But, you know, I was watching the behind the scenes and Tom Cruise, he did it like successfully like a couple times. And the director's like, all right, you know, hey, we're done. We got it, Tom. And Tom's like, you know, I don't think we got it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, but then everybody can going to say no to Tom Cruise. And the director's like, okay. And then they're like, well, I guess we're doing it. You know, each time they're running the stunt, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know. I would imagine it's it's a lot of money. Right. To, you know, each take is is you know. So Tom is like, no, we're doing it again. You know, and, and at a certain point, it's like, who's in charge here? You know, is Tom in charge? And then you're seeing this too with actors becoming directors a lot more. You know, Michael B. Jordan just directed Creed, right? Right. Uh, this was unheard of, unheard of 30, 40 years ago. But this actually connects into the social media, like sort of echo chamber, where the social capital that you accumulate by putting your face in front of everybody is, is starting to have more weight in the boardroom, right? They're saying, hey, you know what? People like Michael B. Jordan, have him direct it. Fuck it. Doesn't matter if he's directed a bunch of things before. And I'm not throwing shade to Michael B. Jordan. If you're an actor for that long, there's a good chance you're probably honestly a good director because you're around it all the time. I mean, you're acting. So I'm not throwing shade to him. I think, I think he, he did a great job with this latest film. Like quarterbacks and coaches. Right, right, right. A lot of quarterbacks, a lot of coaches were, right, they were, they were players, right? So that's happening more and more. And this actually connects right into the influencer thing and social media. Um, you know, the social capital of your face and putting yourself out there is starting to snowball and it's becoming even more powerful. So that actually dovetails into the whole cinema thing too, like with Tom Cruise. I mean, like, again, like he was kind of directing Mission Impossible. Might have not gotten the official title, but you could tell. You look at those behind-the-scenes footage. He's like, no, I don't like... That's what a director does. A director says, I don't like this shot. Before, the act, they said the actor would be like, I don't like this. They'd be like, shut up, go to your trailer. <laughs> you know? Now it's not like that. So they're getting more and more power. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not going to say here because I don't... I personally don't... I don't know. It might make the art form better. It might not. I don't know. But it's happening. Hmm. You know? So in terms of this like, very complicated systems and dynamic... Right. As you said, even with Mission Impossible, the director is not a known name. He's a well-known director. So I think the power redistribution is a very interesting thing. And of course, Tom Cruise is one of the biggest actors of all time. So with that being said, like from your experience, Santiago, like is there such thing as like an if factor? Like when you come across, whether it's a narrative film, commercial film, indie film, to tie everything together, like what are some of the criteria that you've seen over and over again as like an overarching theme? There you said, yep, this film has got it. Capital aside, is there such thing as like an if factor? If What is like a list of criteria that you've seen that really separates great film from a good film? Ooh, okay. Well, uh, you know, I think I'm, I I'm going to give away the farm here, but this is no secret. <laughs> and it's fine because it's, it's an interesting thing, right? A lot of people would disagree with me. But I think the best films, um, at least the films I like the most, they can appeal to the average person and they can also appeal to cinephiles. Mm. You know, they've got that they've got the meat, the the intellectual meat that somebody who's really intelligent can chew on, but they've also got the more tertiary basic layers that and not to throw shade to the average person, but you know, somebody who doesn't make films all the time or somebody who's not, you know, just wants to go to the movie and enjoy something entertaining. You gotta kinda satisfy both. You know, you've gotta take, you know, somebody who cares nothing about the art form and you've got to impress them. A big issue in the industry right now, and this dovetails into a lot of other I'm not going to name festivals, but I'll just say it, it's a big issue. And, and, and filmmakers privately talk about this, but we don't like to publicly talk about it because, you know, everyone's very sensitive about, you know, calling other people's projects not great. But, right. you know, I kind of like it when people knock stuff, even if they knock my project. But at the end of the day, a lot of filmmakers, and this goes for musicians too, will make films for filmmakers. And they don't realize that they're alienating this, this, is, this is when people roll their eyes when you say, hey, watch my film or, hey, you know, let's go watch this indie film. A lot of normal people would be like, uh, okay, but they'll go see Top Gun. They'll right. go see Avatar. Right. 
And then the filmmaker community is like, oh, Avatar, oh, Top Gun, you know, like people will like it, but deep down inside, they'll say, this is a Marvel movie or this is a commercial movie. And so there's this, it's almost like this external battle between the consumer and the person making it. But I've noticed that the most successful directors and my favorite directors, they take the challenge of having to appeal to the average person as a challenge and they enjoy it. And they say, let me make something that's packaged for the average person, but let me also pack in deep philosophical and, and intellectual themes. That's, you know, so, so they're hitting both. And, and I'll give you an example, Tarantino. Okay, I'm sitting here. I'm obviously, I like Tarantino. Every filmmaker in LA is like, I like Tarantino. You know, it's a very typical thing to like, okay, granted. But he does a great job because what he does is he tackles genre films and he makes them exciting. But they're also really well-made films. And a lot of filmmakers, you know, whether you like him or not, they respect him. You know, and he's got very controversial things about him, of course. You know, every, every filmmaker does. And if you're saying something that means anything, you're going to piss off some people. But he's a great example of somebody that's treaded the line there. Stanley Kubrick, same thing. You know, 2001, very intellectual, very deep. There's a lot there. I mean, he predicted, you know, the, the iPad and the iPhone, like, in the 60s. That's the crazy thing about that movie. And I'm not going to go into too much of a tangent here. His films become more relevant as time goes on. Most films fade and, you know, oh, that was a cool movie and you forget about it a year later. We're still talking about this movie. 60, 70 years later. I think it was it's almost like, yeah, yeah, 60 years later. You know, and it's becoming more relevant. And you're going, wow, he was, and every year that passes, you're going, wow, I'm understanding even more about it. It's crazy. I mean, it's like, it's unreal how prophetic a lot of his work was. Right. And I can't say that about a lot of other directors. I mean, even like uh, Back to the Future, Terminator, sure. Skynet. Yes. Those references are coming back. Yeah. And I feel like great art or piece of art, what qualifies as great is like wine. He seasons well over time. This is true. I mean, at the end of the day, this is entertainment. And that also gets forgotten too. Right. You know, it sounds like I'm knocking indie cinema. I'm not. I love indie cinema. There are so many amazing indie classics. I just know as artists and even, even you know... Um, you know, researchers or, I mean, this, this, this extends, what I'm talking about, I think extends into almost every field, right? But I think it's specifically consumer facing uh, fields. I think this is a big problem where the experts start making stuff for the experts and they lose, they forget who they're making this for. And that's something that I think is um, really, really important. So that's actually a perfect segue. I want to go into maybe some investment and capital and some of the insidious impact mm -hmm. with Marvel. So I am aware of this. I think, I think it's a fact. Feel free to fact check me. Sure. Where, as you've alluded to, Marvel and especially Disney has been pumping out like six, seven Marvel movies every year for the last quite a few years at a, such a rampant and unprecedented speed. And a lot of the behind the scene influence is a lot of Chinese events. Investors are buying out IPs and a lot of the chunks of these behind the scenes influence with Marvel specifically on right. Disney. And of course... That's a very for-profit model where let's neglect and forego a little bit of the character development, subplots, all these nuances that I think really creates a buy-in for a lot of the viewers that made Stan Lee's Marvel comics such lovable for decades and decades. I think we're losing that a little bit because of this mass production aspect. Uh, any thoughts uh, coming up for oh, you there? so many, so many. I'm so <laughs> glad you brought this up. Yeah, I, I think everybody would agree with me. I think every filmmaker deep down inside goes, they know what's going on. Everything, once it gets super corporate and institutional, it just, you know, it starts, it starts losing its flair. You know, Amazon just did Lord of the Rings again. No, we don't need another Lord of the Rings film. Like, the first three films, and maybe The Hobbit, it's, just, it, it's done. It's done. We don't need to keep making it. I mean, if you want to have Peter Jackson, who made the originals that did so. So what, what I think a lot of people are sensing is it turns into kind of a cash grab. Let's mm. be real. Lord of the Rings. I love, I, you, you know, it's taking, it's like imagine a little kid, you know, a little kid loves Lord of the Rings or something. I love Lord of the Rings. I love Star Wars. And they grew up on that. I'm, I'm the little kid, okay? Right. And, and then you say, I'm making a movie. And they go, really? And then you go watch it and they get you in the theater. You spend the money. You sit in the seat and you go... This isn't, this is not, and so it's almost like taking it, I hate to say it, but it is truly like taking advantage of the wonder and the, and the good feelings that you had as a kid or a young person or, or as, an, as an older person, whatever, when it came out, like the original. Like nostalgia. Yeah, I'll be honest. 
I don't end up at the theater as much as I used to anymore. And I'm not watching like every every show that's a recreate. I'm not watching a lot of those. I'm watching them for market research, but I can tell very quickly that, like, for example, with the Amazon Lord of the Rings series. I mean, the elves had like short hair, or they're like, you know, and it's just like, come on, guys, like, what are we doing here? Like, just just make something new, but they don't want to do that because the insurance of the property, the IP, is so powerful and it is so lucrative that they are not going to, because like I said earlier, how it's all a gamble, right? Filmmaking is gambling. Nobody wants to admit this, but it's true. It is total gambling. You have better odds of probably, honestly, honestly, you have probably better odds of going to Vegas and gambling a million dollars, a million dollars, a million dollars than you do making money off of a film. It's the truth. So many films completely flop, unless you have a big studio carrying you, and Netflix isn't profitable yet, right? Amazon was about to go under their whole media. I mean, they're, so it is, it, is a, it is a master gambling play, but think about it. If you're gambling, you want to you wanna find the lowest risk asset you know, like if you're buying property, it's like, well, do you want to buy property in Indiana on a farm that you don't know if you're going to be able to sell it? Or are you going to go to where there's a lot of liquidity, New York City? It's a little bloated, but you have liquidity. If you need to sell that piece of property, you're going to be able to sell it instantly. In Indiana, you might, it, might sit on the, it might sit on the shelf for two, three years. So it's the same thing with filmmaking, right? It's like the Marvel, that, that's like property in New York City. You're going to be able to have a higher chance. You might be wrong. You might buy it 2007 and then have the 2009 crash or whatever, right? 2008 crash. You know, so there's always an element of like, But, you know, like if, if you're investing, you want something that's more secure. And those IPs, just to an investor and intuitively, wouldn't that make more sense? Hey, let's take a chance in this filmmaker's idea when 99% of those ideas fail. Or let me put money into a Spider-Man movie, which has a 40% chance of failing. What are you going to do? So that those market conditions are what, and this is where I think business people and, and entrepreneurs can really connect to this, right? It's like, that's what's, that's at the end of the day, what's driving the art form. And it's always been this tug between that and the art. And until we break through that, until that becomes, an, an, uh, and it's kind of happened with the music industry, with what I was saying earlier, mm-hmm. until that happens, filmmaking will be tied down. And the true, like, the beauty of what it can be. That's why I don't think film is dead. It's not dead. In fact, we're just getting started. A lot of people are saying video games are the next element. I have big disagreements with one of my best friends about this. He's like, oh, well, you know, films have already been done. Video games, are the, it's, it's all about VR. And I'm like, you know, until the art form is released of the chains of being so capitally, you know, so such a slave to capital, we're never going to see the full evolution of it. But it will happen one day. And with AI, we're starting to, it might happen actually a little faster than we even thought, which is a whole other thing. You tapped into my frequency. So I want to yeah. get into the rise of technological front ends like AI, machine learning with film. So you sort of talked about in passing where some people argue that modern filmmaking has lost the essence of this classical flair right. that made films what they are. Original IP. Right. So I want to ask you to elaborate more on this debate, not contentious per se, but just debate between why filmmaking could be dead or why isn't it dead per your opinion and tying that into this loaded question about what do you think this really means in this current 2023 era mm-hmm. with this rise of machine learning and Oof. AI, like mid journey and things like that. Oh, that's, so, you know, that's really exciting to talk about because I think, you know, like any good movie, right? A movie starts off with conflict and it's a resolution, right? So you put the character in some, some st- situation and he's got to get out or she's got to get out. Right. And so that is, you know, with AI and with mid journey and with machine learning, um, we're, we might actually see those barriers come down a lot faster, you know, because again, it, I mentioned the conflict. Let me, let me step back a little bit. Like a good movie, there's conflict, right? And what's our conflict when it comes to our discussion right now about the, the, the film industry? The conflict is money, right? That's usually the conflict in most people's lives, right? But so money, right? So how do we solve that? How does the, the barrier of capital come down and how is it shattered so that the the full creativity can flow, right? So that's our dilemma here. And the filmmaking has been fighting that ever since the beginning. How do I get enough money to make this idea? Most ideas are made because you know you have a certain amount of money. Let's just say it's an indie film and you're doing it for a million dollars or 400 grand, which people do. You say, I've got 400 grand. 
I'm going to make a story that is works for 400 grand. It's not about the story I want to make, right? It's what can I make for $400,000? And you can trick yourself into thinking, oh, well, that's a creative challenge. And it is. It is a creative challenge, and really good filmmakers are able to make it work. They're able to go, I have, I have this much money. I can make this idea. This will work, right? And that's how you get these amazing movies. And every film has been made like that, by the way. Almost every single one. Once in a while, they give Scorsese or they give Cameron just unlimited budget, and he can just do whatever the hell he wants. Or, you know, like uh, I think Kim Jong Il, I think he kidnapped some filmmakers <laughs> in Korea back in the day, and he actually I think gave he it, did. He did, and, and he gave them unlimited resources. So they were like, he was like, just make whatever, because he loved their films and the actresses. He was like, just go, just do whatever, you know? So that happens sometimes, right? Unfettered, just complete creativity. But that usually isn't the case. So, Anyway, tying this back into mid-journey, into AI, with AI and machine learning, you're able to generate, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you're able to generate these photorealistic images. So if I type in, I want a foggy day in, you know, 1940s, um, you know, San Francisco or something, it's going to print that and a wide shot at an F2 or whatever, right? It's going to print that for me. Now, what was the barrier before? Now, now, if I can render photorealistic environments by just playing with AI. Like now, for right now, with Midjourney, I'm sure we're all familiar with Midjourney, you can type in a prompt and you get an image. You get a still image. Now, you can't do a lot with a still image. It's great for conceptualizing, it's great for understanding where you're going to go. But what's the next step? Okay, I'm doing a movie that takes place in 1940s China, for example, which we're working on a project for this. And render me this entire landscape with extras, with buildings, with atmosphere, everything, just like you did in Midjourney, but now render it in 3D. So I can upload that into a program, right? Now I can move around the world. Now this would have taken thousands of hours, hundreds maybe, for a really good team, right? We're talking millions of dollars of visual effects, maybe a couple hundred thousand. You get what I'm saying though? Like we're talking serious manpower. And like a full team. Yeah, serious, serious firepower from a, right, from a fiscal perspective. But now imagine you're able to generate all that for, for free or cheap, like, like, like one, one millionth of the cost. Now all of a sudden, I can do a film in ancient China or ancient Greece or ancient whatever, you know, and I can actually do that now as, a, as like a layman and then take it to the next level. Imagine you have your actors... You don't, even, you don't even really need your actors. Let's just say you have a thousand pictures of Tom Cruise. Let's just say you have a thousand pictures of Sandra Bullock. You, do, you run you know, a stable diffusion learning model on their faces. You get the machine learning algorithm for that. And then now you're plugging it in to scenes that you're creating with AI. And you say, I need Tom Cruise to walk over the... You know, and obviously, we're getting better with like controlling mid-journey and controlling these uh, prompt-based programs. Like stable diffusion, for example is so much more powerful than mid-journey in a lot of ways because of the variability. So for example, if I need a character to pose a certain way, I can do that in stable diffusion. It's really hard though, because it's like lines of code and there's like interface. It's like way more confusing for the average person than mid-journey. But you know, we're getting that control because that's the issue right now. As I, as, as I type in a prompt and it just kind of spits something random out. But if I, if I know what I want in my brain and I can kind of get close and I can start to direct the AI to create that, then all of a sudden, and then we get to a place to where I can take any actor, I can take anybody, I can do machine learning on them, and I can put them in these environments, and I can make an entire film in complete, and it will look photorealistic. We're not there yet, but I honestly didn't think that was going to happen for like 10, 20 years, and to be honest with you, I think we're kind of, we're like really close, like we're like almost there now, mm -hmm. and that's crazy. That's really exciting. It's also really scary because I want to give actors, you know, I don't want to just outsource the actors. But, you know, there are going to be situations where that's going to become a big thing, you know. So I want to once again make this connection with mental health somehow. So BetterHelp is under scrutiny. They, I think they had a $3 million lawsuit. Uh -huh. Of course, BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that connects you with licensed therapists. And they were caught that they were using some of the data and information uh, against the consumers or the clients' knowledge. Uh, the therapist didn't know this is the yeah. platform the companies. And of course, $3 million slap is, it's nothing. Of course. As all these situations go. But my point is, 
connecting this with this like precipice of technology film, mm -hmm. in a sense, I feel like this takes away the power from actors because they are the faces or the brands of the movie where maybe it re-emphasizes or places the focal point back on the actual art or the film. Because now you can outsource the actual actors and actresses right. without using them. Sure. Just the representations of what they are, who they are. Um, so I bring this up because I feel like with digital therapy rising, as it should, because that increases accessibility for service for a lot of clients and help seekers. At the same time, I think whenever we're faced with certain rapid expansions of a certain new technology, whether it's digital therapy for mental health or in terms of AI and filmmaking, there are intended consequences and there's unintended consequences. So tying to this vast questions, what do you feel like are some of the intended and unintended things you foresee coming yeah. with everything we talked about? Maybe it's placing the emphasis out of the actors into the actual film and anything in between. I think we're dealing with that question across the board in every sector. So this 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 is kind of a... So it's a great line of thought to kind of go down. Okay, so one of the unintended consequences will obviously be displacement. First of all, AI is based off of what we've created, right? right? It's a pale image of us. So I'm a humanist in that regard. I think that human beings, we can't really explain yet how, how we, we don't know really how powerful we are. We're, we're, we're in this phase right now. And this actually happens, this is actually what I felt 2001. This is my interpretation of 2001 which is we put all of our faith in AI, right? We, we almost feel inferior. You know, AI doesn't need to eat, doesn't need to sleep. It's, it's got, you know, it, it, all of our worldly impediments have been solved by AI. It's not affected by it. So in that regard, as a humanist, I believe that the value and input of a human being is still ex going to exceed what artificial intelligence can do in a lot of ways, especially when it, if, there's a very famous clip with Miyazaki talking to uh, his, 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 his protégés. They present him a, an AI-generated model of like a zombie moving. And they, they're, they're excited to show him. And he watches it, and he's sitting there like, you know, this old Japanese man, lying, <laughs> and he's just kind of looking at him. And, and, and then you're like, you start to realize as he's watching it, you're like, he doesn't like this, hmm. right? And then they stop the clip, and then Hayao looks at them, and he goes, what is this? He goes, and he goes, it's a, it's, it's a machine learning algorithm. It's, it's AI. We've created AI to make something look disgusting. And he goes, and he goes in this story, he starts talking about this disabled man that he sees every day on the way to work and how, and, and basically the, the point of what he tries to make is that the AI will never, and I don't know if I'm right about this, but this is how he felt. It will never be able to experience or understand human emotion or pain in the way that we will. It doesn't know loss. It, does, it doesn't. It can. It can project and it can abstract that, right? And this is where it's debatable. I mean, I don't know, but you know that. And that's that's the true core of where music, art, filmmaking is coming from. Is the reason why us if we're making if we're making content and films and art for humans. The human experience that produced that that desire to want to make that is something that I think that we need to value, and that is not going away. And that has to do with, you know, the, my humanist approach, which, which is I don't think AI is going to replace us. I think it's going to make a lot of mundane tasks a lot easier. And it's going to allow us to be able to do more important things and, and lean into our critical thought and lean into, you know. So I know that's not exactly an answer of like intended consequences and unintended consequences. But I do think that is laying the groundwork for what I feel is going to be the battle and I think it's going to be a it's going to be a pretty bloody battle. There's going to be a lot of displacement. A lot of people are going to get ahead of themselves and be like, "Oh, AI is here, bye," you know. But I think we're going to realize, and this is what happens in 2001, is he has to fight the AI, you know, after you thinking the AI is superior. But at the end of the day, the human wins, right? But in that fight, nine, eight of the eight of the nine crew members, I believe it was eight, I think it was eight or nine crew members, were killed by AI. You know, so and it's the same thing with Terminator, the Terminator films, right? It's it's going to be a in ground fight, excuse my friend. It's going to be a ground fight. It's going to be a fight to the death, in my opinion. So there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences that are going to be really ugly. 
And I don't know what those are, to be honest with you. I don't really know. I think, yeah, obviously actors being replaced, digitizing certain personalities, digitizing directors, right? You're going to be able to digitize all of Stanley Kubrick's movies and make a movie like Kubrick. You're going to be able to digitize Tom Cruise and have a performance like Tom Cruise. But at the end of the day, the AI doesn't understand in a fundamental way what we actually went through to produce those experiences. It can only mirror. I love that because I feel like emotions is such a big thing. Yeah. This emotionality, this reaction to someone else's emotions and tying this into this nostalgia of hijacking through a capitalistic right. model in the right. Disney or Marvel films we talked about sure. earlier, where I think for a lot of folks, at least for myself, when I go watch a film, it's because it incited a certain nostalgia and I buy into the experience a lived experiences or displayed experiences of the actors and actresses within this plot. I see a piece of myself in them that I say, wow, that's resonating. That's right. powerful. Right. I feel it. Right. So I wonder how that even impacts people knowing that because it's about informed consent. They can't lie to them saying that, oh, we didn't, we displaced the actors, but they're actually in it. They, it there has to be some legality around that, right? So assuming that they are very upfront about that through legality reasons, right. I wonder how many consumers lose that interest because they don't feel connected with artificial intelligence or this artificially created film versus without this displayed emotions. And I want to tie this into your philosophy sure. because you talked about intellectual films quite a few times throughout and you talked about your humanist. I'm the same way. And I think emotions and philosophy are very much related because to me, I mean, philosophy is um, it's, it's just um, archives or ability to study other people's before us, their behaviors, their ways of life. So like for you, Santiago, speaking of realistic films that portray real emotions, right. because mental health is emotions, right. versus this new uprising of maybe more AI-driven films, that lack that human connections. Uh, how do you think like philosophy, specific Greek philosophy, helps inform your creative approach or how you view filmmaking as an art for you personally? So particularly with philosophy, I think, um, you know, it's all about being succinct. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of go on a couple tangents here, but if good films, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but I think that a great film has a very is very economical, right? It doesn't it doesn't take too long to say what it needs to say. A good screenplay or a good film, every scene is moving something forward. Even if it's a scene where they're just driving down the street and they're not saying anything, you know, some somebody might say, "Oh, well, that's not important." So no, the character is having a thoughtful moment, and and maybe we need that thoughtful moment right now because something happened. You know, or maybe they're falling in love. Uh, James Cameron talks about how they were going to cut out a scene of of, of them just flying on the, on the on those winged creatures, and they said, "Oh, it's too long, James. What is it doing?" And he goes, "It's they're falling in love. They're having a moment where they're actually able to experience this." You know, so going back to the economy of it all, right? I think economy of language is really important with philosophy, connecting it to Greek philosophy. I mean, if you look at the Socratic texts or Aristotle's writings or Plato, whatever, right? It's, you know, it's very, it's just very clear, simple. It's, it's kind of the antithesis of almost German philosophy. Um, German, you know, the sort of, you know, Hegel and, and Kant and all these guys, they very much were kind of very hyper complex, very much a linguistic discipline in that regard. And that's why I think I personally didn't connect with it so much when I was getting into it because the disjunct between German and English and the translational error, when you're cutting with such a fine, precise knife, you know, through this, through these, these things, it just gets so lost and so muddled, you know, and it's so hard to like really understand, you know, it's like, oh, well, he, does he mean this or does he mean that? Where are we going? You know, it, it's just, it's really hard when it's that technical, technical philosophy. Whereas what I love about the Greek philosophy and, and how it relates to filmmaking is it's just very clear and it's to the point, and it's simple in its own way. I mean, it's all philosophy is a little complex, obviously. But, you know, when you compare it to the technicality of German philosophy and the modern philosophy, it's a lot more simplified. When it comes to filmmaking, and this goes back to my point earlier about how it needs to be made for the common person. Good film made for the common person has the... It's like a Disney movie that it's good for a kid. Kids love Disney movies. But the adults are also laughing, 
right? That's hard to do. That's really hard to do, and it freaks people out. That's why they don't do Finding it. Finding Nemo, classic. Great Disney films, great Pixar films, right? So anyway, Greek philosophy has that simplicity to it, and that simplicity is the core, I think, of what makes what makes really good entertainment. It maybe maybe an abstract indie film is more like the technical German philosophy. As a philosopher's philosopher, you get bored with the Greek stuff. You go, I need to get into this technical stuff. I need something to chew on. As a guitarist, you get bored of playing power chords and whole notes. You know, you're like, you get bored of two five one chord progressions. You get bored of four four time. So you start getting into three four time. You start getting into all these really complex. And there's a point where like it just starts. You just start to become less reachable. You know what I mean? You, you get where I'm going with this. You know. It's interesting because it sounds like, of course, this is oversimplifications. But if you look at like a thirty thousand foot view of German philosophy, right. it's very self indulgent, self gratifying. Right. It's about the evolutions of our way of thinking right. through these hyper complex topics. Right. Whereas Greek philosophers is for the people, right? In a lot of ways, right? Of course, Aristotle, Plato, they're for the people. But it to me it sounds like Santiago. The common thread between these philosophy that you're into and filmmaking, the Greek filmmaking. It's refined simplicity. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. R- right, because you know, uh, musically too, and I come from a background of of music as well with my family, and you know, never underestimate a whole note. You know, some of the most powerful songs have some very basic chord progressions, or maybe they don't. But you know, the idea of of embracing that simplicity, and I and I think it freaks people out because it feels like a contradiction. How can something advanced be so simple, right? That's where it is. That's that's the <laughs> that's it. You know, you can get technical. You can get advanced. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I think you need to go there. You need to experience that, right? But but I think when you start looking at the greats, you start coming back to that. And I'll just one last point I'll add about the Greek philosophy. I did quite a bit of philosophy in school as well. In addition to film, I did a you know double major. And one of my final papers was on how Aristotle's notion of form and matter, um, this distinction between like a sort of intellectual property, if you if you will, and the physical matter, right? Like we're form and matter, right? Like there's the DNA that has the intelligence that is like here's how to structure our body, and then there's like the meat and the bones and like the actual material, right? Well, anyway. The final paper was about how the unified field theory, and or even quantum physics, was essentially getting around to what Aristotle was trying to say 2,000 years ago. That he was basically saying what the cutting edge of physics was just getting to in the 20, in 20 you know, whenever I graduated, right? Um, and that was kind of mind-boggling for me. It just kind of happened because I was I was bu- I was bumping around like string theory and quark theory, and then naturally you get to uh, unified field theory, and then you start you know you know the idea of like as you get smaller par- in particle size, things start behaving more dynamically, more randomly, right? right? And so if you just take that philosophical idea and you go, okay, well, what's the extreme of a smaller and smaller particle size? If they're behaving more random as they get smaller, then isn't the smallest unit of the universe complete randomness? Isn't it complete dynamicness? And then this actually, ironically, dovetails into a lot of religion, right? A lot of religions will kind of get there too. And then so you're starting to see this common theme between like Greek philosophy, religion, and um, science. And that was like really intense for me because I was like, wow, it's all, they're all kind of saying the same thing. And you you hear that with a lot of people that want to be very a-religious. They're like, look, all religions are saying similar things. It's be good to your neighbor, take care of yourself, don't be an asshole, <laughs> don't be difficult, don't right. be mean, right? And then again, you go, you go to science, and it's like science, the cutting edge of science starts to get there. So anyway, I know that was a bit of a tangent, but the idea of us learning from the ancients and us connecting all of these themes, humor me this too, or at least I'll just go here real quick. It's worth it. Look at the story of the hero arc, right? They would say that a lot of, um, like, take the Bible. Right, the arc of of um, Jesus, that is the the hero's journey. That is the basis of almost every major film ever. Like like look, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix. I mean, I could go on and on. And it is also a similar journey to a lot of other religions as well. Right, the hero's journey is something that is ancient, and this is where we can tie it into the biblical side of things. A lot of these ideas have been around for thousands of years and they say no no idea is new right when it comes to filmmaking and when you start to really make films you start to write scripts and you start to really realize it you're like 
wow, it kind of already has been done, and you can tweak it and make it unique. And I'm not saying that there's a lot to dig out, okay? I'm not saying it's all done. But in some senses, the basic themes, the major themes, and the major arcs have been kind of carved out. And it's not just in the last hundred years. It's like thousands of years ago. So I think there's a lot to learn from the ancients. And they, were, they kept it simple, which I love. And I think that's what a lot of religious scholars view, whether it's Quran, the Bible, and the right. Bible is the oldest original text in the Western culture. Yeah. We call it a sacred text because they didn't have Google Drive. They didn't have Google Docs back then. There is no sharing their knowledge. They're confined by their mobilities, right? They're traveling with donkeys and it takes months and years. So how can this idea of like original thoughts it's a fallacy because these thoughts by the, the founding fathers, the pioneers before us, not by hundreds, as you said, but thousands of years with, your, like a, with the physical limitations, cultural right. limitations, sure, sure. transcends time and space where yeah. we still resonate with Stoic philosophy, for example. Right. Right. Ryan Holiday, prolific author, he still talks about meditations that was written by thousands of years, years ago, right? And I think it's such a powerful thing. I think that's the humanality or the humanistic lens we're talking about, where I think AI or these machine learnings still lack. And of course, there's also AGI versus AI, which is very different. AGI? Yeah, which is, it's basically like Turing test and AGI is, Got it. it's, it's beyond just the primed data sets, which is what AIs are. Oh, I see. Uh, but that's a different... The uh, Turing test is to see if it's human, right? Right, right, right. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, down the road. Yeah. But I want to make this connection with what Kanye West said in a recent interview where, you know, aside from how I feel about that guy, he was asked, I think by Lex Freeman on his podcast, where what is your ultimate goal in life? He said, I want to be forgotten. And he said, what does that mean? He said, well, if you look at the infrastructure, the roads, the light bulbs, you know, Tesla's scandals aside, right, from him stealing the idea, etc. All the greatest innovators have been forgotten, but their product or their art it reverberates for centuries to come. I think that ties back to refined simplicity, where I think all great things outlast. Just right. like great stories, like Hero's Arc or Hero's right. Journey, right. outlast the context that right. are within. That is so, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, the persistence throughout time, this, this universality of time is, is, is really interesting when you really think about it. It's like, how do you make something that is going to fit within that? You know, and, that, and that's kind of where I think a lot of, Filmmakers, they don't, they, they don't want to go there because they're afraid of that. Because it's, it, I mean, there's such big shoes, it's such big shoes to fill, right? Right? I mean, to make something like Michelangelo's David, to make something like, you know, um, the Mona Lisa, or, or to, you know, I mean, not to just quote your European art, you know, but you know what I mean? These come to mind. And it's really interesting because that is something that I think a lot of filmmakers will just, tying it back to film, they'll just kind of be like, hey, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's, that's too big. So I'm just not going to do that. But I think the, mo the most recent modern filmmaker that actually was able to pull that off, Stanley Kubrick kind of did that. He was like Shakespeare. You know how they say Shakespeare would like kind of wrote all the stories, right? They're like, he, he kind of just covered all of it. That's why his films, that's why if I had to name one filmmaker that really just nailed it, it was him. I mean, he, he made, I forgot, it was like nine or eight or nine films. Every single film of his, every, whether you like it or not, every single film of his withstands the test of time in, in, a, in a very intense way. And he also very much, it's, it's like, this is, this is why people, I think, it's not very obvious at first, but once you start writing films and once you start looking at films, you start to realize, you're like, this guy did all the stories already. You know, filmmaking had already kind of hit it. You know, like he had technologically reached this perfect point where like the 50s and the 40s, it was still like some black and white, they had color, right? But like, you know, it was still finding its way. By the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, filmmaking had kind of had all the technological advancements it was really going to have minus some CGI, right? I'll give you an example. Look at The Shining. Now, The Shining's a great horror film, right? Everybody knows The Shining. It's, it's, it's ubiquitous, um, universally loved, but... Have you ever like thought about the like why the shining is so amazing? I'll tell you why. I'm not gonna put not putting on the spot here. <laughs> okay. But it's a family drama. So what is the what is the metaphor for what they're they're in a Snowden house? Well, what is that a metaphor for? That's a, that or Snowden uh, you know Psychotic Dad. <laughs> yeah, psychotic dad, but it, but it's the idea of a family unit. It's like a um 
an over-dramatized extreme version of like what the family unit goes through. And the reason why that movie is so incredible is because he took a topic that relates to every human being on planet Earth, which is you and your family. Everyone knows that everyone in their family, I don't care who you are, you've had arguments with your family. And it's uncomfortable, right? There have been times where someone slammed a door, right? It's just, it just happens. Like, let's be real. We're human beings, right? But he, he does a thing where he kind of gets you. He says, come, come into the theater. Come, we're going to watch a horror movie. And then about two and a half hours in or two hours in, you realize, oh, my God, he made this about me. <laughs> oh, my God. And it hits you personally, you know? And you're like, fuck. And then you're like, he did it. He, he made the quintessential family drama. He did it already. Oh, no, now I can't do that, you know? And he, he, but he did this with a lot of movies, like a lot of topics. Like he did it with like Full Metal Jacket and war movies. Like he hit all the beats. Like if you had to talk about a topic and you said war, and you said what are the most important beats that you need to hit to fully describe war, he hit all the beats. What are the beats you need to hit to understand family dramas? He hit all the beats. Like what do you, what do, you do now? You know what I mean? Like, 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 and then, you know, Lolita, for example. What are all the beats you can hit with like like a romance tale? Well, he took a very extreme version. Think about this. Think about it's about a guy who is, mm -hmm. isn't right. Like just for the audience, right? Lolita is about a film about an older man who who fancies a, a teenage girl, and he shouldn't be because it's obviously pedophilia, right? So it's a very controversial film. But in the fifties, men had all the power, right? So if you had to metaphorically or symbolically represent the dynamic between male and female in the 50s. It was like the man was like the father, and the wife, even though they were the same age, was kind of like the daughter, because she didn't have as much power, and she had to kind of, right? So, and she, and very much the female could be seen as a young woman, right? The old man and the young woman. I mean, that was the kind of the, the philosophical description of a, like a typical dynamic. And so, you know, you don't think it's about that, <laughs> And then you're like, oh, it's actually a symbolic representation, an extreme version of the basic fundamental dynamics between married couples or romance in the 50s. The changes with time, of course. But it's, it's, it's crazy. And he always gets you, though. You don't know it's about that. You don't know that's what he's doing. And then it's like uh, about an hour into the movie, or if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you catch on or if you watch it a lot, you realize that's what he did. And you're like, oh, my God, he did it all already. Like the conflict, the desire to escape from that conflict, yeah. but you're stuck, in this case, extremified of being stuck in this isolated snow mountain resort. Wow, I never actually thought about that. It's, yeah, it's the quintessential family drama. It's just made extreme. And, it, and he packages it as a fun horror film. I just want to go see a horror film with my friends. And then you realize, so that's the, the philosophical meat of it. You're like, oh, my God, this is deep and artistically like well beyond what I expected. And that's, that's, that's why I think he's such a genius. A reference comes to my mind with the uh, drama Netflix, uh, his show, You, right? Where um, the main actor, Penn, who plays yeah. Joe, he was talking about this on Conan's podcast, Conan Needs a Friend. And he talks about, or they were talking about why You is one of the few Netflix series that gets better as the season moves on, like a fine aged wine, right. which hits all the criteria for a great show or great filmmaking in right. today's distributions or um, streaming era he talks about if you look at joe the main psychotic person with psychopathy sociopath who commits mur like serial murder these are spoilers if you haven't seen it by now then right, right, you know right. it's too late but he talks about where every single person can relate to the serial killer yes because he has this monologue because 90 percent of the shows are his monologue and they go through this contemplations. Oh, do I want to do this? Oh, I'm doing this out of love. And I think you breaks this hero's journey arc really well. Because it's not a hero's journey anymore. Right. It's right. very complex. Sure. It's dynamic. And humans are multidimensional. Of course. And humans are very complex. Which is the biggest struggle in mental health where people often have this very fixed expectations that life is linear. If I do this, then this happens. How can I love someone and hate someone at the same time? You can. How can I be happy and grieving at the same right. time? You can, because humans are complex. Sure. And I feel like it's a reason why you does really well, according to, and I agree with them, where right. Right. so many people bought into this sadistic, horrible per person right. that nobody should like. And then it's really about them, kind of. But they relate, because you thought about stalking someone. You thought about, out of pure rage and despair, really hurting yeah. the one you used to love, but now you right. despise right. after heartbreak. 
but we don't do that because we're limited by moralities, laws. Yet in a filmmaking, I think this is a reason why filmmaking isn't dead because it's still a powerful avenue like food and music. It transcends context, and it can create a bind for everyone. That's a really interesting. I didn't, I didn't think about that with you. Oh, not you, but <laughs> <laughs> the show you, the show you. Pun intended. Yeah. Um, no, but that that's really interesting because you're right. I didn't. It is about everyone, and that's so obvious because the show's called you. You. But when you um, depart from a relationship or a friend or something like that, right? And there's a, it's a violent thing. You know, yeah, you might not talk to them, but in the show, it's personified as a murder, maybe, or maybe yeah. it's you know, right? So it's like it's that that is exactly, and maybe that's maybe we can attribute to that to, um, or maybe that can be the reason for its success is that, you know, it hits you and you realize that as you kind of go through it. And that's that's amazing. I didn't, I never thought about that. Wow, that's the best part too. Is I love it when you know you're talking about it. That's what I love about films too. It's like you can talk about it with your friends and. And then suddenly somebody, you know, brings up a point like that. And you're like, and then you look at it completely differently. And then it, and I, I personally get goosebumps sometimes because I'm just like, whoa, that's, you know, and then when you've seen it, you've spent time with these characters. All of a sudden that means a lot more. Yeah, that's, that's deep. I think filmmaking really does help us enlighten ourselves. You know, I, I think it's really important for us to understand other people's experiences. And I think in that sense, there's a lot of good that the, the craft can do because of that. It, it, can, it can really bring you to those realizations. You know, when you see in The Shining, when they're walking up the stairs and Jack Nicholson is trying to, you know, hit her with the bat, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I've, I've you know, people have gone through that around me. You know, I've seen people, my, you know, my friend's parents had a divorce or maybe my parents had a fight or something, you know, and it, it's never as bad. As, no one's like killing each other. I mean, maybe <laughs> in some situations there are, they are, right? I mean, I, I'm, I don't know what people have experienced, but you can relate to that and, you, and then and then and then you learn and you go oh like there's another great scene too where well that same scene where he goes i'm working i'm focused on my work and you're bothering me and it's like how many times have we heard that i mean let's be real like if somebody is you know even with your girlfriend or something like that or or maybe your or your girlfriend says that to you right and they're like hey you're bothering me like i need to work if i'm going to be doing this how can you do you know these these dynamics they just feel so personal and you suddenly realize something about yourself and you go whoa and then you maybe stop something stop doing something or you might you're a little more conscious cuz you go oh that's ugly and when when you when, when the mirror is put in front of you when you don't even expect it that's always when when it when it gets in there you know you're not expecting it to be about you. Your guard is down. And then when you see that and you experience it, you're like, uh, then it really cuts in. Whereas if somebody tries to tell you soberly, just like, hey, this is what you should do. You're doing this wrong. Oh, shut up. You know? So I think that's also a really amazing feature of films and stuff like that. Yeah, that movie is very deep. Very, very deep. And I think this is fitting to what you just said, the heart and soul. And because I do believe that art imitates life. And life also imitates art in many senses, which is, the, I think, the ethos of today's conversations. For you, Santiago, as a pretty prolific, I mean, you're still... I'm getting there. You're, you're getting there, I'm right? I'm getting there. I'm trying to make stuff happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've done, some stuff happen. You've but, done you know. some cool things in your life. Yeah. And a lot of experiences in filmmaking. Sure. What do you think filmmaking as a whole has taught you about life that you often think about and you still even implement in you know, a very practical living sense? Because I do feel like the purpose of philosophy is to improve the quality of our life, whatever that means. But tying that into this artistic lens we're in, this context we're in right now, what has filmmaking taught you about ooh, life? Ooh, I've got, I've got a fun answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, let's go back to the spiritual side of it a little bit, right? We've connected art, philosophy, religion. We've connected it all, I feel like, you know, uh, technology. Spiritually, what is enlightenment? to some people. I think, I think we can generally understand enlightenment as a form of awareness, right? It's like deep awareness. If you're enlightened, or I'm not saying I'm enlightened, I'm just saying we're all on our path towards enlightenment, both on an individual level and as a society, as a species, right? We're always oriented towards that. And obviously there are some pullbacks sometimes in that process throughout history, which are, you know, it's not a straight line, it's going to zigzag and, you know. But anyway, filmmaking for me has caused me to be very curious about other people's lives. And that can be a little weird, but hey, you know, to everybody that's judging me right now, we're on Instagram all day. <laughs> right. Not all day, but we're on, we're on social media a lot and that's something that has consumed our lives and we didn't have a choice by the way right it just happened and that's kind of where movies started 
right? It's in, it's looking into other people's lives. If you wanted to understand what it was like to be a royal in you know the 1800s England or the 1700s, you watch Barry Lyndon. If if you wanted to, you know, you get where I'm going with this. So in that regard, those experiences of watching a film allow us to understand our fellow human a lot better. Now with social media, that just opened the gate. Right before, you had to watch a film or you had to know somebody. Now you can watch a film, you can know somebody, you can maybe play a video game, and you have social media. So the input of understanding our fellow human being, and animals, I guess, right, everybody, Mm -hmm. is just rapidly expanding. So, you know, some people think I'm weird for this, but I actually love, like, if you look at my Instagram, like, I follow just, like, a lot of accounts. Like, like unusually, like, I've followed, like, I've, like, I've, like... Like 7,000, like, yeah, a lot. Yeah, I, I, follow, I follow a lot. But it's... Be, and, and again, it's like, why would you do that? Are you, are you nosy? No, it's because if I'm going to be preparing material, you have to write what you know, right? They say that, right? Like, every filmmaker, they'll say that. Write what you know. If you, if you were a lawyer, write a lawyer drama. If you collect the trash, write something that involves... You know, because you know that. But now we have technology, we have social media, where everyone's just putting all this information away for free. You had to go do research. You had to go to the library and read books. You know, you you still have to do that. But now I can absorb, like, the lives of thousands of people and personalities and I can absorb it all. And now my scope of not only my understanding of of fellow human beings and, and creatures, right, I understand them more now. So I have more empathy, and it has brought me to a place to where I can, you know, just understand them more. But also, it allows me to write more stories, and it allows me to have more accuracy. And I think that's really important. If you're a filmmaker, Jerry Seinfeld actually came. I love Jerry. Um, he came out and, and said this recently, or he didn't really come out, but he was talking about this. He goes, every time he's at his friend's house, he's always observing. He's looking around. And he goes, well, why would you do that? He's like, because I'm always thinking about ideas. I'm always thinking about story ideas. I'm always, whenever, when a friend, you know, calls me in a, with a manic episode or when I see something going on in the street or I watch something happening on social media or I'm like, what is the story there? You know, and, and it helps me understand that person. And then, you know, you can go down a rabbit hole and it can be very time consuming. But the point is, is that at the end of the day, I walk away with a better understanding of everybody and who they are and who we're living with. And also, this cut, This is the last thing I, I really want to touch on. The international thing that's happening right now. You know, you look at what's happening with K-dramas, you know. Um, you look at what's happening with um, just all the international cinema. You look at what happened at the Oscars. Our civilizations are colliding, right? Everyone, Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. I mean, it's all, we're in this time period right now where just like Moore's Law and just like the technological exponential you know, situation that we're dealing with in terms of advancement, culturally we're integrating so deeply. So we have to almost go out of our way to understand our fellow, you know, human beings because we don't have a choice anymore. You could live isolated, right? But in a thousand years, are you going to be able to really live isolated in your own little community, right? No, you can't. Even now, if you're living in LA and New York or wherever, you know, it's very diverse. You have to understand other cultures. You know, you have to understand everybody, and that's something that filmmaking has brought me closer to. And it's something that I think that is it, it's the most powerful part of the medium is it provides a path towards a more enlightened society. And that's not to put it on a pedestal. All art does that. And I just think that's the most grand kind of larger picture evolution of, of where it all goes, you know. So anyway. Yeah, I think art is the gateway to the greater unknown. And I think uh, it's very powerful. And... Yeah, no, that was, uh, I never thought to make this connection, but last thing I want to say is, I think that's the reason why news and the headliner culture is so toxic, because you're getting exposed to these atrocities and tragedies, mass shootings, domestic violence, etc., without the contextualized background of who the people are. And because I think stories allow us to humanize one another, right? which I think is the underlying theme you're alluding to here. And yeah, I do agree with you. I do feel like we do need to sit down in this polarity and this America, American political climate landscape is, I think, attributable to this lack of conversations. Sure. And that's why I love mental health, because mental health is this idea that you are not alone. You may feel alone, utterly sometimes, in this consuming darkness, depressions, anxiety, whatever. But often than not, none of us walk this path of life alone. And there's many of us with the same species, 
who go through similar but different things. And I think that gives us a little more hope that, yes, suffering is part of life, whether you believe in nihilistic philosophy or not. Um, I do feel like that creates this comfort, and I think it diminishes the unknown because at least we're walking together because life is this unknowable thing. Like God is unknowable. Right. I, that's beautiful. I mean, that's, that's a great way to, great way to put it. And, you know, we're all in this journey together and, and like, you know, if something like art can bring us together or filmmaking can bring us together and help us understand each other, which is what you just said, then it's a beautiful thing. I got to do my job as a podcaster too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. You know? But yeah, with that being said, Santiago, that was, uh, my head is about to explode just from the amount of knowledge that's, that's, you, that's what I wanted. you, you that's offloaded. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, this is my red carpet moment. I want to roll out the red carpet for you. Where can people check out your portfolio, your amazing, Ooh. amazing projects, sure. your amazing art that you create, sure. your Instagram, anything in between? Sure. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram. That's probably the easiest way to see stuff. I also have a website. So it's um, at Santiago Calagero. That's S-A-N-T-I-A-G-O. C A L O G E R O. It's a long one. It's a long one. Get it from Benoit. Benoit uh-huh. I'll give it to you. But um, and then my website's just myname.com. Um, so yeah, a lot of my art's there. And um, you know, if anybody wants to uh, make a movie, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on a couple projects right now. We just did a film with um, uh, maybe I shouldn't talk about it, but we just did a film that's going to be released soon. Um, that we actually shot in K Town, and we shot it all on sixteen millimeter film, um, which is just so cool. And it's a very multicultural story. And the last thing I'll say is that's that's kind of where we want to be, you know, with with all my partners and, you know, obviously all of our collaborations. It's telling the stories that are going to be help this goal that we talked about, you know, because, again, everything's changing and all these new markets are emerging and it's getting pretty exciting. So anyway. Yeah. Doing cool shit with your friends is pretty cool. That's a great that's a great way to live life. Yeah. Yeah, so I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and the wealth of knowledge and expertise you shared. I definitely learned a lot from you. And I will spend days to unpack uh, what we said. But I do feel like whether it's filmmaking, AI, technology, philosophy, or mental health, it's just additional avenue to view life through. Because the hierarchy of ignorance, the more you know, the more you know nothing. At the same time, I do feel like this curiosity, this way of living keeps life infinitely interesting because life is filled with hardships. Yeah. So, well, thank you for having me, Benoit. And it was, a, it was a pleasure. Yeah. And to all the viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube, we will include all of Santiago's information in the show notes in the link below as always. And I do know that attention in 2023 is the rarest and the hardest commodity everyone's fighting for, even long form podcasts like myself. So I really infinitely def- have gratitude and I really appreciate you for coming back week after week. Uh, the podcast is near a four-year journey, especially with this podcast studio built out. So I want to do this in perpetuity. So if you enjoyed anything, derived any value from today's episode, I ask you to share this with one friend, not two, but one friend. That's the best way to grow my show and to keep inviting amazing, fascinating people like Santiago who don't only leave life with their larger-than-self passion, but they also lead life with integrity that I really respect from afar on and off the shows. And as always, um, if you have enjoyed this, I hope that you derive something to discover more about, about your own life. And as always, until next time in the next week's train of Discover More. Thank you for tuning in.